So our first speaker is Lindley Dixon, who's the associate director of the Real Organic Project. She's an organic farmer from Colorado, and uh, she's got a PhD in soil science. She was the scientist at Cornucopia Institute for a number of years and worked for the USDA before that. And she's going to talk about uh, our pilot program. So Lindley? Thank you, Dave. So yes, I'm Lindley Dixon, uh, the Associate Director of the Real Organic Project. I just want to say that I'm so proud to work for a grassroots effort that is farmer-led. I think that's really rare to get farmers off the farm, and I feel so privileged to work for farmers. And so I, I just want to acknowledge how hard it is to make a living farming and then also have to fight for everything that you do. And so I appreciate all the farmers that are here and that are involved in the Real Organic Project in this really early stage when there isn't any label, there's no market value yet, yet they're supporting us anyway. So thank you to all the farmers. So we've come together to reaffirm that organic farming by law is more than just using approved inputs off the national list. Organic farming is nurturing healthy soils. Organic farming is integrating systems to cycle nutrients. It's, to many of us, it's the triple bottom line, even though a lot of those things aren't in the law, it's the reason why we do what we do. People want all of this when they go to the grocery store, but it's becoming harder and harder for them to find it. And so that's why we've all come together. Uh, my background is studying a fungus called Cornespera cassicola, and what it's done is give me this sense of awe in terms of how much biodiversity there is in nature. This one fungus grows as a saprophyte on dead material. It causes disease on over 150 host plants. Some of them are host-specific. Others are endophytes that navigate their way through the plant and don't cause disease. And you take a step back and look at how much biodiversity is in one, one species. It, and then the fact that there's, we've only described 99.99% of the microbes are actually undescribed. That's called microbial dark matter. And so if I'm looking at all this diversity in one described species, it just gives you this sense of awe. And that is what organic farmers have always had, is just this sense of awe of how much biodiversity is out there. And their goal isn't to you know, simplify it, reduce it, and conquer it, and be masters of it. It's to acknowledge that we can never do that. And if we try, we will fail. And so um, that's what organic farmers have always been so good at, is, is acknowledging that biodiversity and working within those systems. Uh, my my um, master's degree was at West Virginia University, who is only one of four um, research programs that actually studied organic farming systems in the year 2000. One of four, that, those were my choices for graduate school to study organic farming systems. Could you imagine where we would be if we had the funding that the, chemi the chemical industry has had? So this has really been a movement that has you know, been farmer to farmer, teaching each other you know, open source. And um, it's changed, it's gotten better, but it's, the research is still dwarfed compared to how much has been invested in. Um, this is, this is a study that was produced around the time I was in grad school from the farm that I did research on. And feed the soil to feed the plant was not something I put in underneath the title. This is what I was taught. I was not taught how to use inputs off the national list, how to apply liquid fertilizer. Some of the systems that we're opposing right now completely 100% rely on inputs off the national list. And, and so in forever, this is what organic farming has been. It's been to feed the soil, to feed the plant. Uh, I'm going to let Ann Clay really dive into this, but when I was in graduate school, th this is what I was taught. So it's been, it's been part of organic farming forever, that the more diverse ecology you have on the soil surface, you've got all these root niches underneath and some tap roots that go down deep. And the idea is that each of those exudates that come out of the roots is actually attracting different life. And so the more diverse you are on the soil surface, the more diverse you are underneath. And that system actually draws carbon out of the atmosphere and puts it into the soil. 
The coolest thing about this that I didn't know is that it actually provides crops with resistance to diseases, insects, and drought. That's amazing. And so we're getting a handle on this research, but this is, this is, we are, we, it's the tip of the iceberg, what we know about those interactions. Uh, there's a bacterial rhizobia interaction, and underneath it is a mycorrhizal uh, interaction. And what I wasn't aware of until I got into graduate school is that those symbioses don't form when nutrients are readily available. So it isn't until the uh, nitrogen is limiting that that plant actually allows the rhizobia to form with its roots. And it isn't until the phosphorus is limiting that that interaction will happen. And that's the mycorrhizae go down and scavenge phosphorus. So if you've got a system that's just readily applying liquid nutrients, you're not gonna get those interactions. You're not gonna sustainably produce those nutrients. This is why diverse cover crop mixtures are so important. So it's only after the grass in the cover crop sequesters the nitrogen that the legume will then start creating nitrogen from the atmosphere in those rhizobia. So the opposite is true when it breaks down. The next season, the legumes that are storing a lot of nitrogen break down first and make the nitrogen available to the crop right away, whereas the grasses take, slow, you know, take a longer time to break down, and then the nitrogen is available later in the season. So it's this beautiful system, and the more diverse you have your cover crops, the, you know, the more diverse that those nutrients are released too. So it's just, again, this reverence for biodiversity for making it all work in a sustainable way. In 1995, the NOSB actually defined organic production as a management system that promotes and enhances biodiversity, biological cycles, and soil biological activity. They understood this. It's based on minimal use of off-farm inputs and on management practices that restore, maintain, and enhance ecological harmony. So organic farming is all of these things. It's not just the use of approved inputs off the national list, and that's where we've come to today is that definition of organic from the USDA. So the law is good. It's just the implementation and enforcement of the law that's lacking right now. The minimal use of off-farm off inputs is called low input farming. And that was something that I studied back at West Virginia University, the difference between high input and low input farming. So low input agriculture combines different production systems to cycle nutrients. And this is an example of under sowing corn with a legume, for example or allowing animals to eat down a cover crop, pigs to turn a compost pile, or silvopasture, which is actually grazing animals under trees. So these are integrated systems, and that's what low input agriculture is, and they're the future of farming because they reduce dependence on fossil fuels. Uh, the Real Organic Project advisory member, uh, Paul Hawken, has written a book on drawing carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into the soil, and he ranks silvopasture as the number four way to do this. So these are really important things that we're doing that are gonna make a huge difference. Number one was refrigeration chemicals or something like that. So the, you know, we have this kind of narrow mindset of what's causing global warming, and I think it's really important to acknowledge how much agriculture is affecting it, and it's also the solution. In contrast, we have these high input practices that are bringing in purchase fertility rather than generating it through natural systems. So even if it's organically approved on that national list, you have these production systems that depend on really unsustainable resources. So if we're mining a wetland bog or we're capturing forage fish from the ocean in order to provide our nutrients or we're depending on a CAFO for you know, the manure or we're using conventional soy uh, for hydrolyzed soy as a fertility, which is a very common uh, practice. It's, it's really what the hydroponic systems are based off of. Then, you know, yes, that's a, on the national list and you're allowed to do it, but the entire system is dependent on that. And so we need to acknowledge this as a community. And even if some of the farmers are using those as, as really small inputs, it's something that we're aware of because the reason why we went into organic farming was not to do things like this. So it, we just need to acknowledge it and improve on these systems, not create systems that are fully dependent on it. 
this is why I farm. This is my river uh, in southwest Durango, Colorado. Um, the Animas River was at record lows. We haven't seen it as low as it was last year. And so we're in probably a couple decades of drought. You know, the moisture comes and goes each year, but over the last couple decades, it's been really dry. And this is a half a mile from the farm, 100,000 acres burned last year. Uh, it was called the 416 fire, and it was one of the largest in Colorado history. In 2015, the Gold King mine spill turned our river orange, the same you know, river that is in drought and that we all use for our irrigation water. Uh, so this was from heavy metal tailings from mining up above us. We are all farming with these ecological disasters that have been handed to us as we're farming as a solution to all of these problems. And so we're, we're constantly thinking of continuous improvement. How can I minimize my impact? And it's a really, uh, it kind of drives every, everything we do, even if it's not you know, approved in organics or, or part of the organic law, we're still trying to figure out how we can reduce our impact on all these things. Um, this is just my town. These are the issues in my town. And so I'm sure you all have stories of what's going on in your town. The Lindsay, Lindsay Lusher Shoot, who was the co-director of, or co-founder of the National Young Farmers Coalition, her farm is part of our pilot project. And she uh, explained what, what I'm trying to say so eloquently. As we read the recent climate reports and see the rise of rural poverty, the increase in diet-related disease, and the crash of biodiversity, we know that the state of agriculture grows more important by the day. This work means so much more than the modest income it provides. Our labor is for the land, our country, and our planet. And this is why I farm too. That's my husband, uh, and he farms full-time uh, now that I'm mostly off the farm. And my brother is there uh, on the right, but these are the reasons why we entered farming and, and we're not alone. This is why a lot of us are doing it. Farming is a tangible way to make a sane living in this insanity that we've inherited and it feels good. There's something that feels good about it. And our CSA me members feel good about it too. <laughs> So when we got started, we ran one of those market style CSAs where, where the community could come pick up everything on the farm. And it was, it was so awesome. We were renting land right in the middle of town, um, but we, we lost it. And uh, I was told at the time when we lost our land by a longtime farm in the area, I've seen more farmers come and go than I have fingers and toes. And it was just the most tragic thing that I'd ever heard. And I thought, gosh, I don't wanna be one of them. I'm not gonna be one of them. We're gonna figure this out. We're gonna get secure land. And so eight seasons later, after renting three different plots, we uh, closed on our land. Uh, we have a farm service agency lo loan last June, and we saved these six acres with developments paved around all sides from becoming another development. And it just feels awesome. We're proud of the fact that we do a little bit of strip tillage. These are the things that we're, you know, the processes that we're trying to figure out. So we keep the land permanently covered in our aisles. We do very um, shallow tillage and we get all the leaves from all those surrounding developments and our laying hens converted into compost. This is my daughter. We've got three uh, high tunnels, Elliot Coleman style, we grow year round in and you know do winter greens unheated. And those uh, milk jugs are actually our passive solar heat collectors. And so it's so sunny in Colorado, we peel those layers off um, manually every day. It's kind of like milking a cow. We got to go out and uh, twice a day open and close the layers, but it allows us to you know get, our, our tunnels don't freeze out unless we want them to all year long without fossil fuels. We, we grow a little bit of everything, but I do want to talk about um, how we've shifted our marketing from direct marketing to this farmer-owned cooperative. Uh, regional farmers are coming together to create production plans and market together and deliver, and it's creating this environment where we're not undercutting each other constantly in a really competitive marketplace. So I think it's going to be a big part of the future. It's been a big part of the past of organic, and it's essential to keep us all farming, which is the goal. Uh, our most profitable crops, the ones that have really kept us uh, in the game and kept us growing, things like peas and beans, are tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, 
herbs, and greens. And those are the five crops that are now hydroponically grown and are super cheap. And so this is what's killing our ability to be a biodiverse farm because our most profitable crops are the price point, the pressure is just really dropping. So we're here for a lot of reasons. The NOP has failed on a lot of things and I'll, I'm not gonna go into them all, but there's a lot more than just this hydroponic issue being approved as organic. Um, the, it's, it's pretty shocking how we've lost the ability to distinguish what we do in the marketplace. And so I went to uh, my grocery store. I'm in the same um, state as Aurora Dairy. And that was the operation that was exposed for not getting their cows out. Um, they have 3,500 cows at each milking facility. It's, it's pretty large and it's very large. Uh, it's bigger than is possible uh, to get cows in and out back to pasture. And they were caught, uh, Washington Post exposed it. And then I get to my grocery store and their, uh, the Aurora Dairy private label is high meadow milk. And that was labeled as organic and local because I'm in Colorado. I was so outraged when I saw that. I thought, we cannot distinguish what we're doing anymore. It's just become impossible. And I w <laughs> when I first met Elliot, who's been my longtime hero, he said, where is the outrage in your generation? I miss the 60s. And I, <laughs> I want to tell him I'm outraged and there are so many farmers that are outraged right now and, and these are our pilot farmers and many farmers who didn't have the opportunity to be pilot farmers but will be part of the project. Uh, Mike Brownback's video has been released. He eloquently talks about uh, the, the Jacksonville, you know, all these farmers coming together in Jacksonville to, to tell the NOSB how much they were outraged at what's going on. And in order to do something about it because that lobbying effort at the NOSB has failed. Uh, we've come together, we've created standards on all the things that we feel the NOP has failed us on. We are the only organic label in the world out of all the organic labels from all the different countries that allows hydroponics to be labeled as organic. So it's no longer a fair marketplace internationally either. So 60 pilot farms have come together in 17 different states, they've all made a public statement that by joining the project that this isn't right, something's wrong. We've tested our standards against these longtime organic farms. They've given feedback. We came together as a standards board over the last two days, adjusted the standards, and we feel ready to expand the program. Every farmer gets a Know Your Farmer video. So the goal is that with this add-on label that we're providing, you can actually, if you see the label, you can go online and find the farmer on their farm just explaining their practices. So it completely opens the door in, in the grocery stores. Of course, you can do that at the farmer's market, but in the grocery stores, the idea is to have that personal connection with the farm. And these videos have been fabulous because the farmers have so much to say. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is from Jennifer Taylor, Lola's Organic Farm, a pilot farm, um, and she's a former NOSB member as well. She said, the NOP can never take from us the real meaning of organic. A label is just a label. It can be stolen at any time. But if we can educate people as to what the label stands for, that is impossible to steal. So we will always have organic farming, even if we've lost USDA organic. We have 45 board members that are leaders in the organic movement, including 11 either current or former NOSB members. Uh, the Soil 7, we call them, uh, many of them are in the room today, and, and these are the folks on the NOSB during that heated debate of, about whether or not uh, a hydroponic system should be called organic. And, and those seven members are, are part of our, our, uh, the Real Organic Project. We have uh, several boards and committees that are all farmer-led. Emily Oakley uh, described best uh, why we've chosen to remain an add-on label to USDA Organic. And it's because it would be like, if we walked away from organic, it would be like handing the word on a silver platter to the same people that took it from us. And so that's a big reason why we've chosen to be an add-on, is to fight for this word in the marketplace that has so much value. Uh, there are many great organic certification agencies out there that 
are not certifying, cert certifying hydroponics. They're not certifying uh, poultry porches that are considered outdoor access by some certifiers. And we're hoping, we, we are planning uh, next year on working with some of them, and we're hoping to work with all of them in the future. We have this concept of getting our label out into the marketplace with these islands of sanity where there's actually a lot of organic farmers. And so if we can all come together, certify all the farmers in that region, we can get you that label sooner and it, it should spread like wildfire from there. That's the plan. The goal is to try to move some of the positions of the organizations that have taken a stance that differs from their membership. And so hopefully we can still have uh, political influence on both the uh, NOSB and the NOP, uh, as, as well as some of these certifiers that have gone astray. So that is our goal. Uh, there, Driscoll's is definitely pushing a lot of soil farm, farmers out of the marketplace. Uh, you'll hear from Real Organic Project farmer Hugh Kent, uh, who, who just, nurtures the soil. I visit his farm and, and he's in, you know, sandy Florida soils and has raised his organic matter. It's just, uh, you know, biodiversity all around the blueberries. It's exemplary. Um, and we just can't distinguish his blueberries in the marketplace from the hydroponics that are just flushing in the blueberry market, especially, uh, you know, really flooding the markets. Uh, Jim Riddle, who's a former NOSB member and also pilot farm, a 20 year organic inspector, he said the U.S. has the strongest standards in the world, but we're just not enforcing them. The more we can do to differentiate the authentic organic, the better, which is why I've chosen to be part of the Real Organic Project. He also said this whole movement towards organic food and farming happened outside the political sphere, and it's not going to go away. So I just want to let you all know that we're not going away. Please join us. Uh, if you go to our website, you can hear from us once every week, once every two weeks. You can hear the latest updates, see the latest Know Your Farmer videos, and tell everybody, forward those emails that we send out, and let's, let's spread this like wildfire because it's important. Thank you.